In this video, I'm going to show you how to solve a complex problem that is certain to appear on any vectors test. All right, so we've talked about vectors and we've talked about how to add vectors to produce a resultant vector. In this video, I want to show you a complex application of vector addition that tends to give people a lot of trouble. Let's head over to the screencast. All right, so we have an example here of a plane flying on a heading of 150 degrees at an air speed of 240 kilometers per hour. There's a steady wind of 35 kilometers per hour blowing from a direction of 30 degrees. Notice that that's a true bearing. And we're being asked to calculate the ground velocity of the plane. Now, ground velocity is going to be a new concept, but it's really just a fancy way of asking us to calculate the resultant when we add these two vectors together. So this is really just an application of vector addition, and we're going to see what happens when we add two vectors that have their own magnitude and direction. So for these problems, I find it's always helpful to start by drawing a diagram. So I'm going to pull up a set of axes here, and I'm just going to sketch out what I'm given. So I know that I'm given a vector that has a magnitude of 240 kilometers per hour, and we're being told that that's on a heading of 150 degrees. Now remember that this is a true bearing, so we start at the north axis and we draw that 150 degree angle in the clockwise direction, and that's going to produce a vector that looks something like this. The next thing we're told is that we have a 35 kilometer per hour wind blowing from a direction of 30 degrees. And again, that is a true bearing. And we know that that's a true bearing because of the zero placeholder in front of the 30. So since the wind is coming from a direction of 30 degrees, we want to draw that vector so that the wind is blowing from that direction. Okay, so at this point we have this diagram, but things are looking pretty messy. It would be nice if we could start building a nice clean vector diagram so that we can actually find out where the resultant vector is and how to calculate the magnitude and the direction of it. And that's going to give us our ground velocity of the plane. So really big, complex, scary looking problem, but we're going to break this down into a simpler problem by redrawing our diagram as a triangle. So I'm going to start by redrawing the vector with a magnitude of 240 degrees, and I'm going to place these vectors tip to tail by moving that wind vector to the tip of the plane vector. Remember when we add vectors, we do so by arranging them from tip to tail. That's gonna allow me to draw my resultant vector from the tail of the plane vector to the tip of the wind vector. So we now have a nice little non-right triangle, but you'll notice that we have no angles in our diagram. And if we wanna do any sort of analysis on this triangle, we need some angles. If you think about your studies of trigonometry, we always try to relate side lengths to angles to help us solve problems. So to fill in our angles, let's go back to our diagram on the left. We want to use that information to somehow come up with the angles for our triangle on the right. So we know that the true bearing of the plane is 150 degrees, but that doesn't actually help us in our diagram on the right. To get started in problems like this, I find it's helpful to draw a little miniature axis at the tail end of one of the vectors. I'm going to start with the plane vector. You can see I've drawn this little miniature axis up here. Now what I want to do is look at this vector on both diagrams. You can see the 240 vector on the right, and you can also see it on the left. Now on the right diagram, if you look at the little wedge that's formed between the new set of axes and that vector, we can find that same wedge on the left. And that's going to be this little wedge right here. And since we know that each one of these quadrants measures 90 degrees, we can subtract out that 90 degrees to find out the measurement of that wedge. And in this case, that's going to be 60 degrees. So I can label that 60 degree angle on my diagram on the right. Now you're probably thinking, all right, that's an angle on the outside of the triangle. How's that going to help me figure out any of the angles on the inside? Well, if I draw a horizontal line at the tip of that vector, you'll see that there's a little Z pattern here. And we know that alternate angles are equal. So we can say that that little angle right there is 60 degrees also. But this isn't very helpful because that's only half of that angle. We need that bottom half of that angle as well. So to figure out the rest of the angle, we're going to draw a little miniature set of axes at the tip of the wind vector. And we're going to take a similar approach. We're going to compare our diagram on the right to the diagram on the left. Now in the diagram on the left, we know that that wind vector is coming in on a bearing of 30 degrees. And as it turns out, by drawing that little set of axes on the right diagram, we're looking at that same 30 degree angle. I can draw another set of axes at the tip of the plane vector. And by doing that, I've formed another Z pattern. So I've got another alternate angle situation where both of those angles are going to be equal to 30 degrees. And since we know that a right angle measures 90 degrees, that's going to allow me to say that that missing angle is also 60 degrees. Now, I promise this is the most challenging part of this problem, which is funny because what we're doing is really just applying angle patterns that you've learned many years ago. 
But after all that tricky work, we end up with a nice 120 degree angle, and that's going to allow us to start analyzing our triangle. Remember, our goal here is to find the magnitude of the resultant vector. So that's this unknown x value here. Well, anytime you're working with a non-right triangle and you've got an angle contained by two sides, that should be a clue that you're going to apply the cosine law, which you'll remember looks like this. And the cosine law says we can take two side lengths and sub them in for A and B, and we can take that contained angle and sub it in for the angle C. Doing that and taking the square root of both sides to solve for C should result in approximately 259.28. So we can replace our unknown side length with that magnitude, and we can say that the magnitude of our ground velocity is 259.28 kilometers per hour. But remember that vectors have both a magnitude and a direction, so this is actually only half of the solution. So to find the direction of our vector, what we want to do is take a look at the angle between our resultant vector and our plane vector, this top angle of our triangle. Now if I wanted to solve for this unknown angle, this is a situation where I have an unknown angle with a side length across from it, as well as an angle with another side length across from it. Now, if you think back to your studies of non-right trigonometry, this should tell you that you should be using the sine law, which we can set up to look like this. And remember that the angle always goes above the side length across from it. We can apply a little bit of algebra work here to bring that 35 up to the other side, and we can take the sine inverse to come up with an angle of 6.71 degrees. So we've determined that that unknown angle at the top of our triangle is 6.71 degrees. But as it turns out, we're not quite finished finding the direction of our resultant vector. Let's bring up another set of axis and we'll move our triangle so that the resultant vector is placed at the center of the axis. When we arrange our triangle in this way, we're able to find a true bearing from the northern axis that rotates clockwise to produce our resultant vector. Remember that our original plane vector was given to be on a heading of 150 degrees. Since that's a true bearing, we start on our north axis and we rotate clockwise. And you can see that our resultant vector is just another 6.71 degrees in the clockwise direction compared to that plane vector. So if we add that 6.71 degree angle to our original 150 degree angle, we're going to come up with an angle measurement of 156.71 degrees. And that should give us the direction of our ground velocity vector. So after all that hard work and analysis, we can say that the ground velocity of the plane is going to be 259.28 kilometers per hour. And that's on a true bearing of 156.71 degrees. <laughs> and so you can see why these problems tend to give people a lot of difficulty. A lot of work, a lot of steps, and a lot of prerequisite knowledge in here. Not only do we have to know how to draw true bearings, but we also need to know how to add vectors using the tip to tail method. And just for good measure, we're going to throw in some non-right trigonometry, as well as some Z pattern angle relationships. Very complex problems that teachers love to put on vectors tests, so you'll want to go over this one a few times.